Welcome to Unlapped. It's race week, just days away from the Emilia Romana Grand Prix in Imola. We have lots to break down per usual to get ready for round seven of the Formula One season. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, like this video, leave us a comment, ask any questions that you might have, and don't forget to subscribe to ESPN for more F1 content. And if you're listening, please hit us with a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. All right, let's roll. Katie George, Nate Saunders, Lawrence Edmondson. Have we come down from the elation that was Lando Norris's first Grand Prix victory, Nate? It's pretty hard to top that. Um, I mean, the whole weekend <laughs> for me was pretty great, as we can talk about in a second. Um, but yeah, I think the Lando win was was amazing, right? Because we needed a we needed a result like that. You know, we needed to see a step forward from a team, and I think it was a very popular win. Um, and it gives us yeah, it gives us a good talking point this weekend. You know, because if McLaren look good again then suddenly we can maybe completely unreasonably get excited about a, a, a closer championship. Um, but yeah, it was pretty great. And, um, you know, the race, I mean, the race itself wasn't, th wasn't thrilling, but it was one of those where a lot was happening and it was dramatic and the jeopardy of not knowing who was going to win until towards the end always makes a great spectacle. So yeah, I loved it. And um, hopefully we get more of the same this weekend. I thought it was thrilling in the fact that you were, on the edge of your seat wondering if he was going to be able to hang on or if something was going to go wrong or not in Lando's favor and risk his chance of crossing first. And luckily he was obviously able to hang on and Oscar Piastri was told to stop fighting in the back of the grid <laughs> just so there was no other safety no car. Safety car. No, no safety, safety car. cars, Oscar. Laz, I didn't get a chance to, to kind of debrief with you post Miami. Nate joined us on the, the ESPN F1 post race show. What did you make of everything that went down in Miami? It was really impressive. And I think it just shows you what is possible in Formula 1 under a regulation set because this same race uh, a year ago, I think McLaren finished 17th and 19th. So yep. you look at that and then you think about the upgrade they brought mid-season last year. And then, of course, the upgrade they brought again in Miami, which kind of gave Lando Norris that ability when he was in clear air to pull away from Max Verstappen, which is just something we so rarely see in Formula 1 for pretty much the last two years, two and a half years, a car being able to pull a gap on a Red Bull. So that was um, that was very good. But like I say, with everything we know about, you know, how difficult it is to beat Max and also the bad luck or the misfortune or the missteps that Lando Norris has made in the past, especially the 2021 Russian Grand Prix where he had that great chance to win and was on the wrong tyres when the rain came down. You still thought at the back here just like something could go wrong, something could go wrong. But um, I think Lando uh, fully deserves it, obviously. But I think also seeing him afterwards, he was, you know, just really riding a wave and just so pleased to get that off his back. He said, you know, that there was quite a lot of pressure, even though he didn't want to admit it. He did say there was um, a lot of pressure having not won a race prior to that moment. So, yeah, I think it was a fantastic good news story for F1. And it does create all these questions going into... Uh, the double header of uh, Imola and Monaco over whether McLaren can maintain that or anyone else can get in the mix. I also think it was important or I guess was a bigger deal that he won for the first time on American soil as F1 continues to try to grow the American fan base. And I think a lot of U.S. citizens, U.S. fans have been drawn to Formula One because of Drive to Survive, right? We all know that what they see on the early seasons of the show is no longer what they see on track because we've gotten so accustomed to seeing Max Verstappen win. So I think as they continue to try to reach all different areas of the States and grow that popularity, I thought it was a big deal that Lando Norris was able to get that win at a U.S. race. Did you guys feel the same? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think um, it just made it a lot more, it, rather than kind of America waking up in the morning and like, oh, Lando won a race that I didn't, that maybe I didn't get up to watch. I think it was it was really important. And then it kind of, everyone was kind of enjoying the moments together afterwards, kind of, you know, in prime time. I suppose it was in prime time um, or just after. So yeah, I, yeah I'd yeah, agree with that. And um, I think if anyone deserved to win their first race in the USA, <laughs> you'd put Lando and then obviously Danny Ricciardo's won races in America before, but like his next race win, you know, he would, he would suit an America win as well. But yeah, I thought, yeah, that's, I hadn't thought of it, Katie, but it's a very good point. I just think parody was uh, helpful and it's not something that we've uh, had the luxury of getting uh, the last couple of seasons. So when we turn our attention, obviously to Italy, you guys fly out when, or you taking the train? How are you getting there? Flying uh, on Wednesday. Flying, yeah, same. So that's uh, tomorrow from the day we're recording. 
Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it should be good. It's going to be a real change from the Miami Grand Prix where it's all singing or dancing, celebrities, huge <laughs> paddocks spread across the Miami Dolphins uh, football field. And then you go to Imola, which is very much an old school European heartland F1 race. Imola is actually quite a sleepy little town in, in northern Italy. And of course, what happened last year where we had uh, flooding there to the point that, yeah. um, of course, they couldn't run the race. Um, I think it's really important that F1 goes back there and hopefully has a, a, a you know, a, a straightforward event and uh, hopefully a good race. But um, yeah, it is it's a bit of a bit of a culture shock between those two, Miami and, and Imola. Probably the look- opposite ends of the spectrum, aren't they, Laz, for in terms yeah. of, I mean, yeah, I, I I would love to take all of you guys, you know, who came to us, who came to Miami with us. To Imola. I mean, it, it it could not, like, it's kind of funny when you go from one to the other. And also just little things, like you get on a smaller, like the plane is, the journey is like two hours, you know. So for us, it's like the sh- easily the shortest journey of the year from the UK. So it just kind of gets into a whole different kind of cycle of the season. When and you... It, can I just add, it has the most ridiculous official title for a Grand Prix. Oh, it does. Any... Shall we read it out? Does someone have I, it? I, I've got it directly in front of me. So it's the <laughs> Formula One. MSC Cruises Grand Premio del Made in Italy e del oh. Emilia Romagna 2024 Grand Prix. I saw oh. people with the the meme of you know Phoebe Buffet on Friends when she's trying to say she's trying to teach Joey French, and then he 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 get he's nearly getting it, and then at the end she says the full thing, and he just goes Imola because he yeah you know, he can't get it. So I think I think to most people they're gonna mock that. Not that title all week. How many how many words? Can you count them up real quick? How many words are in oh, that title? Hang on. I was just comparing it. I've I've got lost on the F1 website. So I was just comparing it to the Monaco Grand Prix, but 20? um which, which is just, like it has no sponsor in it, the Monaco Grand Prix. It's just the um Grand Premier de Monaco. Uh but let me see. So it is one, two. Well, MSC will well, I assume that stands for something, but we'll count that as one word. Three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight, mm-hmm. nine. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And actually, I, I did get it slightly wrong. I, I over blew it a bit because I put Grand Prix at the end. And of course, Grand Premier is already in there. That's the Italian way of saying Grand Prix. So yeah, but still 15. Pretty good, huh? Pretty good. Quite the mouthful. I think they could be a little bit more efficient. But again, I'm not the one paying <laughs> my name in the title. So uh, you can do whatever you want with however much you're forking over. Um, when you guys look at the teams, the packages, the upgrades that are coming. It seems like there's a lot of teams that are bringing upgrades to MLM in particular. Obviously, we saw a decent size upgrade from McLaren uh, with Lando Norris's car. I think Oscar Piastri got about half of those upgrades in Miami, so he didn't get the full deal. He will get the full deal here in Emola. But you've got Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari, and Sauber all bringing certain levels of upgrades to Emola. Laz kind of... I know you put together an extensive article on Friday on ESPN.com. That was an excellent breakdown. Kind of walk us through what you're expecting from these different upgrade packages per team. Yeah, so it's it's all a little bit different. In fact, the McLaren upgrade was originally planned for Imola, and they managed to bring it forward in its entirety on Lando's car, and as you say, kind of 50% on Oscar Piastri. So this is clearly a race that lots of teams have targeted because it's the first one back in Europe, which means you can get you can really run it right to the deadline in terms of producing the parts and still get them to the race on time. So that's one of the reasons that we're seeing so many upgrades at this race. Also, all the lessons they've learned from the early part of the season, they've been able to apply to some extent to these upgrades. The very fact there's an upgrade here would have been planned from way before the start of the year and the teams probably would have had an idea of which way it would go. But there was enough time as well to bring in influences and ideas from those early rounds. So yeah, what it means, I mean, it's a little bit wait and see, but we have had a preview of the Ferrari one because they were testing at Fiorano and they had all the new parts on the car. They were doing a pretty tire test. Um, so we've seen that the side pods are, are quite different in shape. There's a few little different uh, flicks around the cockpit as well, all guiding the air um, in different ways around the car and all kind of working together. You need, when you bring an update, you need it all to be cohesive across the whole entire car to uh, to bring maximum performance. And I suspect there's um, something going on underneath the car as well, which you can't see and, you know, uh, changes to the floor. But we get ma- we get told exactly what's going on with each car on the Friday, before Friday practice. We get a big list of, of, of what's, what's on each car. So it's a bit of a guessing game until then. But we also know that uh, Mercedes had part of their upgrade in Miami 
which was um, the floor, and I can't remember something else. Uh, but the, the, oh, I think it was one that's uh, made front or suspension as well, just changing the way that that influences the aero. Um, but they're bringing even more of that upgrade to to Imola. So um, while Miami seemed a bit disappointed from Mercedes' point of view, it seemed like they didn't really make a, a step forward. It is, of course, all relative. So while McLaren made a big step forward, Mercedes made a smaller one. But now they're bringing the rest of it, and they'll be hoping to to step forward again so um of course you never know until the car hits the track and you never know exactly what's going to happen in terms of the performance of it but these teams are they are quite reliable at, at bringing the extra performance and then the question is 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 whether it closes the gap to Red Bull or not what are Red Bull bringing themselves and and again how, how different is that relative to what the other teams are bringing Ferrari have been talking about this for a while this upgrade the similar upgrade Carlos Sainz especially has been uh talking up quite a lot as the indicator as to whether Ferrari will get themselves, maybe not in a position right now to fight Red Bull, but will they get themselves on a path to be able to take victories off them towards the end of the season on merit? Um, so, yeah, it's all various little things to look out for, look forward to. But again, perhaps don't jump to too early a conclusion because Imola is just one circuit and different upgrades work on different corner types and, and all that kind of stuff. And then um, also it sometimes takes teams a few weeks a few races to understand an upgrade to fully get the full potential from it um and then the other one to keep an eye out so i know i've been talking for a while now but there is a lot <laughs> coming to to Wimler. but um sauber or steak or um kick sauber mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call them uh they're hopefully gonna resolve their uh, pit stop issue with um some new parts which they've been working on ever since they realized at the start of the season that essentially when um everything gets too hot it takes them sometimes 30 seconds to to change a tire when of course when they've done it when everything is cold and it's not a racing temperature they're able to do it much quicker so they'll be hoping for quicker pit stops and it means that if Joe Guan Yu Valtteri Bossas get themselves in a points potential position during a race they might be able to follow through and uh, capitalize on that do you think that it makes McLaren's victory in Miami his first victory since 2021 with their upgrade package more impressive, Nate, because they were able to get a handle on the upgrades and the newness of the car, Lando in particular, given it was a sprint weekend where you don't have as much time in practice to kind of figure out the newness of it. Whereas obviously this weekend, you're going to have more ample time with the car to assess and kind of analyze and, and make tweaks if necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I think as well, if you actually look at Lando's weekend, wasn't perfect until the race mm -hmm. weekend. Until sorry, until the race. Um, but I think what was great for them was that yeah, when the opportunity presented itself, they were able to capitalize, and it was actually a great kind of team performance because you had the upgrade. Lando's performance was great, and they kind of just trusted their instincts. On you know, Lando said, "Let's you know, let's go along," and they said, "Yeah, okay, like we'll, we'll listen to you. Like, let's do that." So I think they did exactly what they needed to do. And actually, what was really impressive about McLaren in Miami was the fact that Piastri looked pretty competitive, mm -hmm. you know, on the car that wasn't fully up updated, up upgraded as well. So, um, yeah, I would say positive all around there. And um, it it would kind of be fascinating to know what would have happened if both those cars had had had, had that on, uh, you know, in Miami, just given the fact that there was, you know, potentially a one, two on the table, who knows? But um, yeah, I would say, I'd say pretty impressive. And probably the, I mean, it is the best case scenario. You introduce an upgrade like that and you win your first race for, you know, a year and a half. It's pretty, pretty spectacular. So would you assume that McLaren's going to be in an even better spot in Imola because they've had some time to work with their upgrades and obviously found success in Miami? Obviously, Oscar, as we mentioned, is going to get a little bit more. Or is Imola's track and circuit so totally different than Miami that it might not lend itself to what they've done? It, it is very different. The temperature is very different as well. And also we've got to remember that while Lando did a fantastic job, he did gain the lead under a safety car and actually over a single lap in qualifying when it mattered, uh, he was struggling still to, to to put it together a little bit. But that's all stuff that they potentially can work out. We, we know that from, from what we saw in Miami that the car has definitely improved and, and improved by a step probably bigger than than your average upgrade brings um but it's it's accessing that performance in all in all corner types in all temperatures um and also um there was a big question over how 
what exactly happened to Max Verstappen's Red Bull during that race? Did it get damaged when he took out that bollard? Uh, and if so, by how much and how much performance did he lose? And was that just a kind of bit of a bogey track for Red Bull anyway? Uh, because it seemed like he struggled a little bit for performance and the balance of the car throughout the weekend. And if that's the case, that's slightly concerning for the rest of the field because he still qualified on pole. And had there not been a safety car, I think we would have seen Lando progress through the field and potentially take the fight to to uh, Max. It's one of those great what ifs. I mean, I've talked to some journalists who are convinced he would have won anyway, um, having crunched some numbers. I'm not so sure. I think it would have been an interesting one to play out, but I think Max probably would have had something in reserve. So, um, yeah, so, so it, it's not guaranteed that they're going to be up there every weekend but if they can start to figure out how to get the most out of the car of a single lap as well that unlocks a little bit more performance and uh and forward they go so it, it's a step but the other thing andrea stella uh the team principal who's um a very well qualified engineer you know he's spent most of his career up, up to a team principal level uh either being a a race engineer or, or senior engineer uh within various teams he said, really, for them to challenge Red Bull, he thinks they need another upgrade of the same level. So, you know, at some point further down the year, you need another one of these Miami-style steps um, in order to mm. catch up with Red Bull. I, I think the positive there is that clearly whatever they're doing back at Woking in that factory, whatever vein of kind of development they are they are mining, there's clearly a lot in there because mm -hmm. they continue to bring performance to the car. So um, I think there's huge positives from it, but I'd be a little bit cautious about mm -hmm. getting carried away and uh, certainly see how um, the next uh, couple of races play out. Monaco is very different, very unique. Uh, Montreal, again, after that, is a very unusual circuit. And then we go to Spain, which is probably a circuit that's going to suit it better. So if McLaren have a little slump in form through Monaco and Montreal, because we know the car's never that great on straights and uh, in slow speed corners, both those uh, uh, circuits have a lot of slow, slow speed corners, it may then bump right back up there in, in Spain. So are you telling fans that they should enjoy the bliss of Lando's win because when we get to Emola, because Red Bull is bringing their own upgrades, that we're going to be back to the dominance that we've uh, grown so accustomed to? I, yeah, I think live in the moment and <laughs> enjoy any driver winning their first race because that only happens once, right? So I think when any driver does that, and especially if you're a fan, um, it's worth kind of celebrating that. But um, yeah, I... It's my slightly sceptical point of view, but anyone who's been watching Formula One um, for the last two and a half, three years, um, I think will know just how good Red Bull is and, and how how much they bounce back. You remember Singapore last year, they were absolutely nowhere on one circuit type. And then in Suzuka, Max went and won by very nearly 20 seconds. So, um, yeah, don't, don't, you know, don't expect too much. Say your expectations relatively low for competitiveness. And then if it's better... You can only be happy with that. Yeah, you've got to remember that the two ways Max has lost a race this year has been his brakes caught fire. And there was a safety car mid-race. I agree with Lawrence. I'm not convinced he would have been caught. I know a lot of journalists were getting excited about it, but there, it, it was quite difficult for cars to overtake at Miami as well. The D, I think they need to look at the DRS. Mm -hmm. So not convinced. Lando could have, you know, had a had a, you know, uh, second or third without that. <clears throat> um, sure. But yeah, it's. I mean. <laughs> We go through these kind of cycles where someone wins, and suddenly everyone's like, "Oh, maybe Red Bull can be caught." And it, you know, they're not they're not a stationary target. Even it's, I think I was there when Stella said that about the the next upgrade, and my first thought was, "Yeah, like, but for that to be the case, you also kind of need Red Bull to just be a stationary target, which sure. they won't be either." You know, we know how good that team is, and you know, forget all the stuff. You know, Adrian Newey leaving that's not how, that's not got any impact on the here and now, um, and the team that works below Adrian is so so good anyway. Um, there's no reason to believe they're going to make some sudden disastrous upgrade that, you know, that, where they lose ground, in my opinion. Hate to say that, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but um, I'm, yeah, I'm probably less optimistic than the, the lads about it. I'd, I'd love to see it, but I just think we need to be careful because if Max wins by, and he didn't just take pole, L Lawrence was right to say he took pole, he took sprint pole, sprint race victory, and and Grand Prix pole in Miami. And then he was second, and he said at the end he wasn't really pushing at the end because he felt, you know, Lando just he didn't get past Lando. So I think there was a lot of mitigating circumstances. You know what? We're going to optimistically speak about one driver in particular then, yeah. if you're not ready to be optimistic about the parity in this sport. 
I want to give some flowers to Yuki Tsunoda because I think his 2024 campaign has been um, really well done. He seems to be in great form. I got to believe that VCAR team principal Laurent Mekis is is really happy with his performance. Just from the early days of his career, Lawrence, to what you've seen, you know, through six races this thus far, what's impressed you about the growth and kind of development you've seen from him? From the very start, we saw that he had quite a lot of raw performance. Um, I seem to remember even the first test that he did ahead of his um, debut season, there was a lot of excitement about one of the lap times he set and wow, you know, is is, is he that quick and he's just gone a little bit under the radar prior to now and not been hyped up enough. So um, while I think, you know, people got a little bit carried away early on, uh, that raw pace is still there and it's always been there. The difficulty has been the consistency and perhaps to some extent um, the the mindset, the mental approach that he's taken to racing. Uh, we've heard so many times his team radio, which can be very entertaining, but shows a driver that can quite easily kind of boil over and um, lose lose his on the radio, which <laughs> is clearly something which um, he's worked on. It's something which I think this year after, you know, early on the, the situation with Daniel Ricciardo on the slowing down lap in Bahrain. Um, since then, uh, he's made a real concerted effort and I don't think I've heard a single Yuki uh, team radio since then that has been shouty or sweary so um, so clearly he's he's aware of how important improving himself is and and you know I think what we're seeing is just a driver mature into more of a, a rounded package and that's the thing with Formula One drivers I mean they're like they you know they're not just like human beings they are human beings they all <laughs> mature at different rates we're not all you know these beautifully well-rounded human beings when we're in our you know early 20s it's just it's just not the case i mean some people never are so um yeah to 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 get to the point now where i think he's really focusing on um all the all the kind of slightly weaker parts of his of his you know ability um in formula 1 and to be able to target them and actually make progress or or, or seem to make progress and certainly get results out of it I think it's very impressive. Um, the other thing is, I think probably last year he was a bit underrated. If you looked at the start of his season, I can't remember exactly how many there were, but there were like four or five 11th place finishes. And as we know from this constant conversation we're having right now about whether points should extend down to 12, um, you know, he was just out of the points in, in those ones. So he didn't quite get the mm -hmm. credit at the end of the year when people go back and see where he finished in the championship. So it was clear that something was there then. So um, I think what we're seeing is... Uh, you know, a driver's starting to fulfill his full potential in a car that is just outside of the top five. But when something goes wrong for one of the top 10 drivers, um, he's able to capitalize. And the fact that he's doing that consistently and then sometimes and then some, you know, getting get in beyond other cars as well is, is particularly impressive. So my hope is that it hasn't already all come a bit too late and people haven't already made up their minds about Yuki Tsunoda. And, you know, because we never hear him in conversations about the top seats. Um, but my hope is that, you know, it continues and therefore he puts himself into that conversation. Do you think that's a possibility if he continues this run of form, Nate, that he could be considered for a more profile seat in 2025? It's hard to see where he could go that would be you know, big enough for, for, for the form he's showing. And I think this is one of the interesting parts now of this silly season we're out. I think it does seem like Sainz is going to fill that kind of that role at Sauber um, going forward. And I think for Sonoda, you know, him staying put with RB is just, it's kind of an underwhelming option for him. You, in an ideal world, there'd be a seat free at the team that's about to take Honda engines, which is Aston Martin. Of course, Aston Martin have signed Fernando Alonso. And I feel like that stroll seat would have been perfect for him. Now, I did hear a, a whisper, a rumor in Miami that one scenario that might play out. Um, and again, this was someone who was kind of speculating, but I think they were speculating based on couple of things they may have heard, you know, and, you know, some things that may be up in the air. Maybe we get to see Sonoda go to Aston Martin next year, but as like reserve driver and then potentially be in the position for 2026. Now, that would be pretty underwhelming, to be honest. It would be great in terms of where it could put him in the, you know, down the line. Mm -hmm. But that to me is the place that you'd want to see someone like Yuki. I mean, him driving a Honda would be like, you know, at a, at a, at the works Honda team at the, at the you know, that their main team awesome. would be ideal. I have heard that he's he's a bit reluctant to be labeled as just the Honda guy, but it does seem to be the best opportunity for him to kind of break out. Ironically, considering Honda 
you know the partnership they've had with Red Bull and with and with um the junior team but it seems like his best opportunity in the long run to break out of that because I mean where else is there maybe you know maybe Williams if they go the different direction from Sargent they don't want Antonelli but I feel like Bottas would probably end up there so it's when you actually start looking at it as as good as Yuki's been it's just difficult to see it I think he's just he's super unlucky in the fact that that all the movement that's happened has already happened and you know seats are kind of set in place um but I'd love to see he's one of those drivers that you'd love to see make that step up to Red Bull and mm. that people probably listen to this being like well what about the Red Bull seat that's the one seat that we kind of every time we talk to people at Red Bull they're like nah he's not he's not going up and I just think Christian Horner's not never been convinced he just thinks that his temperament as good as and Lawrence was completely right like we haven't heard Yuki kind of have a meltdown for a few races now I think the feeling at Red Bull is and I think Helmut Marko is a big fan of Yuki, but I think Christian just thinks you put him in that pressure cooker environment alongside Max and then click of the fingers, you're getting the worst side of Yuki back again. I'm not saying that would happen, but that's, I think, where the rap on him is, whether it's fair or not, you know, we won't know. Um, so, yeah, it's a shame because he's been fantastic, Yuki. And, um, yeah, he's um, he's just box office as well, isn't he? Just as uh, as a mm -hmm. as an individual. Uh He's he's great. He actually told me in Australia when we talked to him in the um in his mix zone session, he said he's he's basically having to tell himself every race when his thumb goes on the radio, he's like, No, no, Yuki, and he's taking his thumb off. Like he's you know, he's kind of he's reminding himself, like, they play your messages, stop doing it. Um, which is kind of yeah, kind of endearing because he's just, you know, he's trying to he's trying to improve for the betterment of 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 all of us. Self-awareness. I think in anger management courses, like the first step is they say count to 10, like maybe you yeah. just counting to 10 before he sends out his radio messages at this point. Um, you mentioned Antonelli and I, I want to ask this question. Um, he was granted a super license is Andre Kimi Antonelli that we're talking about. Um, who's a young phenom. James Vowles was uh, asked in Miami uh, about the potential of having Antonelli uh, in his driver lineup in the foreseeable future, near future, possibly the season future. And Vowles said, we have far bigger problems to solve than drivers at the moment. Laz, if you were a betting man, when do you think we would see an Antonelli sighting when he actually has a fully secured seat in F1? I think the smart money is still on next year. And I think there's a high chance it will be a Mercedes, not a Williams. Um, this all came from this uh, news that broke that the FIA have received a, a request from someone, they wouldn't say who, uh, about someone, they wouldn't say who, but it was quite clearly mm -hmm. Antonelli, to have a driver who's under the 18, uh, able to, to, to get a super license. Um, Antonelli turns 18 later this year. I can't remember his exact birthday but um that kind of sparked rumors that perhaps sergeant was out for Imola and and Antonelli would come in and um you know that's not going to happen so um I think and what Mercedes are doing with Antonelli is absolutely right there's no real reason to to take him out of F2 at the moment um he's barely got his season underway and it's been a pretty shaky start to the season mainly because Prema his his team in Formula 2 has struggled a little bit to get the car in the right place. It's a new car in Formula 2 this year. And so um, there's been a few teething issues. His teammate is Oliver Behrman, who, um, mm -hmm. of course, made his F1 debut with Ferrari in Saudi Arabia. Now, if there's an opportunity along those lines, perhaps Antonelli would be an obvious choice to go forward. Um, and, you know, perhaps this was laying a bit of groundwork there, just in case, say, one of the Williams drivers is unable to, to race, would Antonelli be able to slot in? Uh, quite possibly, or, or even if the same happened at Mercedes. And where this has all come from is 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 that he's done his first test in a Formula One car in a uh, 2021 Mercedes. And from what I've heard, done really very, very well, like really impressed the team, as he has done in pretty much every time that he stepped into a new type of car. When he did his first Formula Two test, I heard sim similar things. And of course, when he was racing in uh, Freca uh, last year, which is essentially former four cars, European championship of that, um, he was also, you know, head and shoulders above um, his competitors. So he's clearly very, very talented. Um, I'm, you know, 99% sure on his way to Formula One, but there just doesn't seem a huge amount of reason to, to fast track him right now. 
Um, of course, you could say, well, if Mercedes can put them in the Williams, then they can understand exactly what they've got for, you know, uh, next year and whether he could replace Lewis Hamilton there. But I think they can do that anyway with with their private tests and and with Formula 2. I think, you know, it, it's a way of doing it where you keep him from the public spotlight as well, a little bit. I mean, people do follow Formula 2 to, to a level, but it's not the same as being in a Formula 1 race all of a sudden. And you'll remember he is still 17 and there's actually a fairly good reason why the FIA set the age at 18 and Max came in and broke all the records and, and was was in a Formula 1 race seat uh, from 17 or whatever it was. Um, I think he was in a car at 16. Um, you know, and, and so F1 did did change it so that that he had to be over 18. And there is a reason for that. And I think it's, it's a very good reason, a very valid reason. And this argument that just because Verstappen did it, then Antonelli should automatically do it because he's seen as a similar generational talent this early on. It's kind of nonsense because it goes back to what I said about Sonoda. Each driver progresses at different rates and Mercedes will be able to see what they've got with Antonelli. And the people I've talked to at Mercedes and also what Toto Wolff said on the record at Mercedes is that they don't want to expose him to that unnecessary pressure so soon out of Formula 4. You know, to go from Formula 4 to Formula 1 in less than a season yeah. is is crazy. I mean, it's it's not completely unheard of. Um, you know, Verstappen was fast-tracked through Formula 3, old Formula 3 to get to... To, to F1 uh, the following year. I think Jensen Button only did a year or two in cars before, between karting and Formula One. Uh, Kimi Raikkonen had a similar incredibly fast you know, progression into Formula One. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. And if you've got the flexibility not to do it and to give Antonelli a proper run at Formula Two, then that makes sense. So everything that everyone seems to be saying on the record and a little bit of what I've heard um, you know, from people in the paddock as well, suggests that that's exactly what Mercedes are doing. So I would be surprised, but, you know, this season has been full of surprises more off the track than on the track, but um, surprises like that, you know, and so I guess you can't rule anything out, but I, I would have thought you'd be looking at him for a 2025 seat, either at Williams or Mercedes, depending on what decision Mercedes make uh, with their driver lineup. If he were to go to Mercedes for 2025, I would, I would like to think... I would hate to think, but it's his results, not mine. That Logan Sargent, if he continues on this path that we've seen this season, I don't foresee Logan Sargent sticking around in his Williams seat past this season. Who then, Nate, would you consider a possibility for that second seat with Alex Albon? I think Valtteri Bottas am, will end up there. Am I wrong about Logan Sargent? No. No, I think... I think... I mean... Like, let's just be honest. I mean, Logan Sargent, he's, not, he's just not done anything. Unless he has an amazing middle Finish. of the season. But okay. we haven't seen any evidence that that's around the corner. It's not like he's down on his luck or he's had a few races where you're like, oh, man, like if, if the strategy had just gone better, maybe he got a point. He's just, you know, he's just not been there. And you compare him to Albon. Albon's been wiping the floor with him so much. So I mean, I would, I'd like to see Bottas go back there. You know, I, I, I mean, you know, maybe there's better options in terms of young drivers. But what Williams want to do is they really want to build themselves back into a first of all a legitimate midfield team and then maybe you know in the in in you know the next 5 10 years maybe try and take a stab at that that top pack now that might sound very very optimistic but that's what James Vales wants to do you really have to have two competitive drivers to do that and Bottas coming back to the team is a great story you know we know what Valtteri could do at Mercedes you know he's i mean i think the whole situation at um Sauber at the moment is just it's just a bit a bit bleak like it doesn't seem like there's a huge amount there for him to be racing for because he knows he's on the way out you know and they're building something that doesn't involve him um so I could see that happening um I mean Liam Lawson could be the other one if you wanted to go for a young driver the, you know from what we understand Red Bull has to give him a seat this year um for him to to stay as part of the Red Bull program it's got a you know yeah. clause in his contract where he could leave that um <clears throat> I actually spoke to Lawson I was waiting for somebody at Red Bull um and first of all, I had to explain who Odell Beckham Jr. was to him because he didn't know who he was. Um, and I did then I did then ask Lawson, like, you know, is that true about your contract? He said, yeah, it is. And, you know, it's been tr true for a while. But he said he feels like he's at the back of the line because he says there's about three moves that have to happen before his career can get sorted out because he is on a few lists for, a few, you know, a few different places. Um, and, yeah, so I, I think that... Um, uh, I I feel like Lawson will end up somewhere, um, but yeah. it just it 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 just it, it's going to play out in a certain way. 
The other one we haven't talked about is Magnussen at Haas. I'm not convinced he'll stay next season. Doesn't sound like he will. Um, sounds like Behrman will go there, so that will replace Magnussen or Hulkenberg, and then they'll have one more seat left. So I think Haas as well would be in the market for a Bottas. I think I feel like Bottas is has enough of a pedigree behind him that one of those teams will go for him. You know, especially if they want kind of someone fairly reliable, fairly quick. You know, with that history, so. I'd say Bottas for Williams, but there's a few good, a few good little options there. I think um, it's just a shame. I think that we don't get more Antonellis. We don't get like you know one of the one of the great bits of the last few weeks in the NFL has been learning about all these new rookies that have come in and you know these exciting young players. And suddenly it's like oh now there's a a league full of you know rookie players now. You know you get that injection every year of youth. It's great we've got Antonelli in, and uh, you know hopefully he does end up at Mercedes. I think that would actually be, a, I think that'd be a fantastic story. Um, it's just a shame if if it is Bottas. As much as I like Bottas, you like uh, it could be Lawson. You know it could be a younger driver. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. But if I had to bet now, I'd say Bottas. Doesn't help that there's only twenty seats. You know. Yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm not three man like, roster. Yeah, you'd never get. That's just one of the drawbacks of having such a, a small yeah. grid. But. Um, yeah, I mean, you 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 can go too far the other way. Like every every time someone leaves, it's like, well, you gotta you gotta pick a you gotta pick a teenager now. That would suck because suddenly the quality of racing would uh would plummet quite quite spectacularly. We're uh we're helping Mario Andretti's case. See, we can have more. Yeah. We can have more drivers on the grid. He should um he should write more letters with Congress. That will help. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, on that note, um, let's talk about a little rumor swirling that had the internet uh fighting arguing i don't know i don't know the internet was kind of ablaze with the rumors that chicago in the united states might get a grand prix um <laughs> i was being texted by people saying are these rumors true are we gonna get a fourth race and i felt like an insider thanks to you guys giving me the heads <laughs> up that like uh no this is not happening so could you please laz um give us a little background i'm sure chicago would love to have a grand prix i'm sure there's a lot of cities in the united states that would now like to host Grand Prix, but is it realistic in the future? Yeah, I did an interview with Stefano Domenicali in China where he said there were 36 potential races uh, wanting to get on the calendar. And I asked him, well, how many of those are serious? And he said 11, which is still a surprising amount. Um, but it's so whether... specific, isn't it? It's like there's 11 yeah, of these 35. Well... Yeah. I mean, it's specific to the point that, you know, he, he's obviously got the number very much at the front of his head and um, is very aware of, of the ones that can potentially come. But the, the other thing we've got to remember is that there's only 24 slots at the moment. Um, but he also said that F1 needs to stick to 24 for now um, or for, you know, the foreseeable For future. your all sake. Uh, well, for, yeah, for, I think for everyone's sake and sanity and, um, yeah, and also the integrity of the championship to some extent. Um so where those 11 would potentially fit in and, and whether Chicago has really won those 11, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I, you know, I think clearly there's a number of places which which would like to do it. But the other thing that Domenicali said in that interview was we have three races in the United States now. We've worked incredibly hard to put those three on, uh, one of which is promoted by Formula One itself, Las Vegas. Um, Miami just saw some uh, you know record TV audiences and um, was fairly well sold out from from what I saw uh, among the official statistics. And then, of course, Austin is, you know, it, it feels like the home of Formula One in the United States now because it's been there since 2012. It's a fantastic track. It's a purpose-built track. It's not a street circuit or some weird hybrid circuit like Miami, car park circuit, if you want to be mean. Um, and so, we yeah, do. You know, I, I think it's a perfect, perfect mix of three. And F1 seems to think that at the moment as well. And F1 also seems to think that there's no space for for, for a third race. So, you know, things do change, uh, you know, backers and promoters and, and so on can fall out of love with Formula One and, you know, contracts obviously will have, have an end point. But for the meantime, yeah, all this kind of hype that Chicago is, is, is coming on seems to be misplaced. Um, I didn't see exactly where that rumor came from. I saw a few of the places that spread it, but I'm not sure exactly how it started. What the I what did. The I, was. <clears throat> there you go. Well, you take over. And, uh, name and shame. Ready to rant about it. So one of the biggest, <laughs> and everything Lauren said, spot on. One of the biggest things that pisses me off at the moment about Formula One media, not media really, is the wider media net, is the amount of nonsense that gets tweeted by aggregator accounts and as fact as like we've been told this or like this is happening 
And people don't look at who's tweeted it. They're just like, oh, that's happening. And the Chicago one came from, I'm not going to say, like, people know where it, like, came from a very big aggregator account. And they said, we've had sources. I spoke to Formula One. They're like, they haven't even reached out to us for us to tell them that's BS. So it's like, if you're doing journalism, the first people you have to ask about a story like that is Formula One. Is Formula One. And it's just, it's just frustrating as a journalist because you're like, we're in the paddock all the time. Like the first, that the, the way the conversation went for me was I spoke to Formula One. I said, this Chicago thing's popped up again. Is it true? No, it's BS. I asked two other people who work for the two of the three races in, in, in the US heard anything about this. Yeah, it's not, it's not true. Okay. Spoke to somebody else, you know, a, a former, uh, a team boss of fairly recently. Have you heard about this? Yeah, it's BS. Okay, great. Four people who are all very better connected than this Twitter account have said it's nonsense, and it's just it's just crazy because it, it builds up steam, and you see a lot of it with like every every day you see someone say Ferrari today at eleven are announcing Adrian Newey is joining the team, and then it's all over Reddit, and then people message you, and you're like it's not true, you know. I'm sure they will at some point at eleven o'clock on some day in the future. Hopefully, Ferrari will announce Adrian Newey, but it's just annoying, and I don't know. I think this is one of the drawbacks of the popularity of formula one right now is there's just so many people who have realized you can get a lot of clout by tweeting news all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and after a while people just stop paying attention to who's actually tweeting it. But, um, I, I actually, th I actually don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility. We get Chicago in this decade because from what I understand, Lawrence is right. Chicago does want this race. And I, I think eventually America F1 will say like, why not have a fourth race here? But there's, there's. I've also heard that like Dallas is really keen for a race. Apparently, Jerry Jones, who's the owner of the Cowboys, one of his biggest regrets is that mm -hmm. in twenty in twenty nineteen and twenty twenty, when he was kind of looking at F one, he didn't really take it as seriously as the guys in Miami did. Yeah, you know, and you're not going like you're not just going to suddenly beat Jerry Jones, and you know he's not just going to like lay down without a fight for that. So I think if there is a fourth race, there's a whole Formula One doesn't need to just accept the first bid that it gets. There's going to be so much interest in that. Um, so yeah, but as I, I, the story that was in was that it would be coming in in 2026, um, and of course we've got Madrid coming that year. Or is it next year? I forget which year Madrid is starting. Um, so yeah, yeah. The, the, it's also a, as Lawrence said, it's a question of where that goes on the calendar. Um, I'll have said all that now, and then you'll see Thursday Formula One proud to announce ten year deal with Chicago. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think that's happening. But no, but you know that. Sometimes, like you see stuff that people get, and you're like, "Oh wow, that person's got like a scoop," and great. You never begrudge that. It's just when it's when the whole internet just follows one story based on a tweet. It's just like, yeah, because then just... you guys have to do damage control. Yeah, and, and it's just counterproductive as well because I think whoever leaked that story to them, it was exactly what they wanted to happen. Everyone's talking about Chicago, 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 and. I don't exactly. think it's done Chicago any good because Formula One are like, well, that story is nonsense. They've had to kick it down. And they're probably like, well, someone from the, I don't know if they did, but you would assume someone related to the race has put that out there. But we 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 get this all the time with London. Every two years, some newspaper in the UK will be like, plans for a big London Grand Prix. And you're like, guys, like, we've we've had this. We like, I'm sure that they, I'm sure they won a race in London. Of course they do. Logistically, are you ever going to pull that off? I don't think so. Chicago. You're not going to have a race downtown. You know, look, Miami tried to do that and they had to move to the Hard Rock Stadium. The only reason Vegas can do it is because of the deal them and Formula One have, which is pretty special. Not sure whether Formula One would do that with a city that isn't Vegas. That's yeah. Just me. Dallas to me, Dallas and Austin are different cities, like culturally, yeah. but they're still in Texas. Like, yeah, I don't I, think I, Dallas yeah, makes yeah, sense yeah. at this point to have when you have Austin so well established, I could understand Chicago wanting to get in the mix because I think people would love to have a Grand Prix in New York city, but that would be a logistical nightmare. But Chicago has somewhat of a similar feel in terms of downtown skyscraper, like city feel um, that New York has, but it might be a little bit more manageable in Chicago. But to your point, like I don't foresee them racing down Lakeshore drive. So uh, I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting to see if we ever get to a point where we've got four. I know the United States is so massive as a country, but God, four seems like a lot in one country. And the other danger is that you end up with a Miami or Madrid, uh, you know, proposed plans for Madrid where you think, oh, great, we're going racing in Madrid. Then you look at it and it's actually an industrial estate. 
on the on yep. the edge of Madrid, or, you know, around a kind of some, you know, uh, ex, expo place. And it's mm-hmm. not, it's just the name the of the place. It, it's not really what you imagine and what you want when when you hear about uh, a race in, in, you know, say Chicago or New York City you immediately think great you know new york cars going down fifth avenue wouldn't that be amazing but mm-hmm. the reality as you say is is quite different um the other one of course which popped up a little while back was osaka which is one of my favorite cities in the world but i don't think it's about to host a host a street race um suzuka's obviously just signed a new deal so i think this is it is that there are places that have interest in it uh whether those are actually backed by you know the local governments as well is is another question or whether it's just somebody thinking i could bring a race here i could be the promoter i've seen how successful it's been elsewhere uh, i'm going to start to create some buzz around it and then you get these kind of stories leaking out and um yeah the reality is that a lot of the time um they are they are bs but you know the the calendar has changed a lot uh, if you if you'd ask people 6 7 years ago whether miami and las vegas would be on the on the calendar they would have laughed at you they, they genuinely sure. would um so things do change and, and things do come around but yeah that story for 2026 as, as as nate said um does appear to be nonsense Ooh, nice nice change of words there you're going to yeah somewhere. i was about to say something else <laughs> but I'm not, I, I saw you down. i was like he's gonna he's gonna say it this is great <laughs> you know what else is nonsense is that the host of the show has not added or subtracted points from Miami. So I don't know exactly where we stand in our oh, predictions nice. race, but I will find it by the time we are done with Emma's race and I will have a, a flow chart for you. I would assume Laz is still winning because that's normally what happens, Nate. But yeah, well, none of us said Norris to win. So I don't know how that's changed I know. seconds and thirds, but we all did say Max first. So I assume we didn't get, we all didn't get the first who. two positions correct. Right, so somebody um, might have hit on third and that P3, and that, that would be about it. Yeah. So I'll have to go back through my notebooks. Anywho, Nathaniel, would you like to start with your predictions for Imola? Absolutely. I'm going to say... As he brushes his beard. Brushes his beard pensively. I'm going to say third place. I'm oh, going to well, say... Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, just for a bit of suspense. Uh, third place, I'm going to say Charles Leclerc. Second place... I'm going to say Lando Norris and then drum roll first place. I don't know why I did suspensefully. I'm going to say Max. I still think Max wins. I just want people to think I was going a different way. I just, I just want you to know that typing that was annoying. So don't yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I can see you kind of being, like having to push the backspace as you went. So sorry, Casey. <laughs> no. Perfect. All right. Again. Max, Lando, Charles, Laz. Well, I did wonder there for a minute. Maybe Nate's going to suggest that Max reti- retires. So maybe we should always do it back to the front. Okay, which way would you prefer I do it? Should I do All it right, go front? back to front. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Right. Now I've got to think of actually who I'm going to pick. Uh, in third place, Lando Norris. Oh. In second place, Carlos Sainz. Ooh. And in first place, Charles Leclerc, a Ferrari 1 2. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. The there you go. So it works, right? Although I did kind That's of what I should pre- have done. preview a little bit that I was going to go that way. But um, yeah, why not? Why not? Why didn't I, I do that? My lead while it's still there will probably disappear. By I anyway. dig that. Oh, that would be awesome. Okay. I'm going to go because I'm in it to win it. Max. Oh, wait, I'm, I've got to go back. You can do it. No, you can, you can do it whatever way you want. But backwards I'm... is the call away now. Okay. Oscar Piastri, P3. Oh, this is so lame. Lando Norris, P2. <laughs> Max Verstappen, P1. Yeah, that's a pretty good guess, actually. That's, yeah, think? I think that's pretty solid. I want to see Oscar redeem himself because I felt like he was having such a great race and then he just got he got in two precarious situations and then found himself at the back. So, mm. But we'll see if he redeems himself. I just wanted there's one 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 thing from this weekend that I just wanted to quickly bring up that I'm quite excited about as in a really nerdy way. Not really Are you nerdy going way, to just watch another match with Ed Sheeran or Oh no, 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 I hadn't actually thought of that. I mean, we didn't even talk about that, did we, at any point, uh, other than the entire time I was in Miami after that. I don't um, think Leeds fans now watch or listen to our podcast. That's fine. We don't need Leeds fans listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, for anyone listening, I, I watched a football game with Ed Sheeran. Don't worry about it. We'll do it. We'll do a show on it one day. Um, I'll talk all about it. Um, I was gonna say, and it was great, by the way. Hoping to see him at another F one race. My mate Ed, who has I don't have his number or anything. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> I was just gonna say one thing. I'm really excited to see, especially if if you're lucky enough to kind of time your drive in with him. This is the first race in Italy for Lewis Hamilton since oh. we had the Ferrari news. And I'm actually quite excited to see how that goes because like mm. the 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 story always is Ferrari fans are Ferrari fans first and they just adopt the driver. Like whoever is the driver, they're like, Yep, we're a fan there now. He's our guy. Lewis obviously, a bit like Max, is a quite a divisive character, you know, very much like you love him or you hate him. I think that's just a just what happens when you've won for a long time. So it'll be really fascinating to see the kind of reaction he gets from the diehard Tifosi that are there. Um and that, you know, I, I'm not sure if he'll have a chance to be on the podium because where Mercedes is that right now, but mm. just an interesting one to keep an eye on uh, yeah, as well. And that's brilliant. And this just popped up in my head as well. Anyone listening on ESPN <clears throat> and hears the commentator and thinks, oh, the commentator, Crofty's got a weird voice this weekend. It's not David Croft on Sky Sports, ESPN's feed. It's Harry Benjamin. So don't adjust your set and think something's wrong with my feed. New commentator, which I think is the first time that will have happened on ESPN's coverage uh, of an F1 race since we got the rights back. So lots of weird things happening. So how will that work? Who's he calling? Who's he doing the race with? Harry Benjamin's stepping in. Uh, I think he's doing it with Brundle. Uh, oh, okay. So he's just stepping in on Sky. Yeah. He's Crofty's not doing just an alternative weeks, weekend, broadcast weekends, for yeah. us. Okay. 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 Yeah. But I think that's actually, I think people are going to kind of lose their minds a little bit when, if they don't know that, they turn on, you're so used to hearing one voice doing a TV show and you're sort of like, hang on a sec, what, like, did something happen? like so the Crofty's going to be trending on like Saturday morning for sure when people are like googling frantically like, where is he so that's where he is he's just taking some time off you don't think he could say lights out away we go like you can't say that if you're stepping into that booth no he's and... got to come up with his own one you what would your him. what would your what would your one be I'd be like and they're off like I'm more excited <laughs> than that you know <laughs> and that's why you have this job oh, and he has that <laughs> yeah exactly I'm going to work on that for next week. Okay. See if they'll you take workshop me it. Next. Everybody yeah. come back with their phrasing. How about that? Now that's what we'll tease to next week after Emma. As always, thank you both for your time. Safe travels to Italy. Enjoy your sleepy town. And not the zunz, zunz, zunz of Miami. Be a nice change of pace. And uh, we'll break everything down post-race here on Unlap. Cheers, guys. Cheers.